Senator Cornyn. Director Ray, after uh, the events of 9-11, I think it was uh, Admiral Bobby Inman who coined the phrase, a failure of imagination. Uh, we just couldn't conceive of the idea that something like what happened on 9-11 would occur, but that was a failure uh, to imagine it. And it strikes me that uh, the events of January the 6th share something in common with 9-11 in the sense that uh, it seemed like there was a failure of imagination. That's not to point the finger at anybody to blame, but merely to try to describe uh, what I think may have occurred. So I think you've told us that these extremists are not monolithic. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, I, I, I've, I've heard the expression that here in Washington, whoever has the best narrative wins. And so sometimes I think the narrative is created and then try to search for facts that might bolster that narrative. But as you said, the fact is there, these extremist groups are not monolithic. So that's, I think, an important part of understanding the threat. I've heard them described, some of these folks described as white supremacists, uh, domestic terrorists, insurrectionists, rioters, seditionists, anarchists, uh, the list goes on and on. But I note that you said there is no federal crime um, described as domestic terrorism per se, correct? That's correct. And as I look at the range of charges that the FBI FBI and the Department of Justice have, uh, have, uh, have made against the people that have been investigated for the events of January the 6th. I read a list of assaulting federal officers, uh, tampering with documents or proceedings, unlawful entry, uh, disorderly conduct, conspiracy, theft of government property. Do you think the current laws are adequate to deal with this threat? It strikes me that these are, these are a lot of different tools that are available, but don't really get to the whole heart of uh, domestic terrorism. Well, uh, I guess I'd say a couple things in response to that. It's, of course, uh, it's of course a very good question. I think, number one, our folks, uh, which is one of the things I love about the men and women of the FBI, have proven uh, time and again that they will work with the tools they have uh, and they are resourceful and entrepreneurial, uh, and we've had remarkably good success uh, at disrupting attacks uh, using the tools that we have. Uh, and sometimes those tools and some of the offenses that you listed off have the virtue of being quite simple and straightforward to prove, and so sometimes that's actually a, a blessing. But certainly, I think uh, you would be hard-pressed to find any FBI director that wouldn't welcome more tools in the toolbox. Fair enough. Well, getting back to this narrative about who was involved on January the 6th, there was a helpful report from the George Washington University Program on Extremism that looked at about uh, 257 federal defendants uh, as a result of uh, the events of January the 6th. They noted that 142 of those 257 defendants they referred to as inspired believers. They said they were need, they concluded they were neither participants in any violent extremist group, um, nor connected with any individual uh, who stormed the Capitol. Um, again, I guess bears out your conclusion, your statement that this is not a monolithic group again. So I think you've touched on two very important points there. One is uh, both with domestic violent extremists and frankly with what we call the homegrown violent extremists, which are the jihadist inspired, uh, the difference between inspired terrorist attacks and over here and, domestic, and, and sort of directed or facilitated you know, in a more structured formal way uh, is something that I think a lot of Americans uh, struggle with understanding. Uh, and more and more, the threat that we face as a country uh, is what I would call the inspired attacks. Uh, they don't have formal membership in an organization. They don't have clear command and control direction uh, in the way that, say, an al-Qaeda sleeper cell might, might have. 
Uh, and that, that's that much more challenging to pursue, A, because there are fewer dots to connect, you know, the old expression about dots to connect. Right. Uh, B, less time in which to connect whatever dots there are. And then, uh, then you add into it C, the, the sort of First Amendment dimensions of people's inspirations and ideology. And then the last point I would make uh, is that we have these, as I said before, increasingly blended ideologies. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Senator Klobuchar's state in Minnesota, we had two individuals uh, who were identified themselves as so-called boogaloo boys, which people tend to put kind of in one bucket. And yet, uh, what they ultimately were charged with was trying to provide material support, as in weapons, to Hamas. And these are not things that neatly fit together in anybody's uh, worldview. So it just illustrates one example, but it illustrates the challenge uh, that we're dealing with. It's the FBI's responsibility to deal with counterintelligence investigations, correct? Yes. And these include things like active measures uh, that we saw used, for example, in uh, 2016. For example, advertising on Facebook, two competing groups to show up at the same time and hoping that conflict and, uh, and maybe even violence would break out. Um, is it true that um, our foreign adversaries used the events of, of January the 6th as a field day in terms of their attempt to uh, establish false personas, fabricate stories on social media platforms with an intent to discredit the United States and its institutions? Uh, certainly we have seen, and I'll keep it at an unclassified level in, in this setting, but uh, foreign adversaries, a number of them, uh, leveraging the events of January 6th to amplify their own narratives, to try to uh, uh, push out propaganda, misinformation, to try to, in their view, accelerate uh, what they think of as the United States' decline. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cornyn.